Welcome to Eastgate Church. I trust you'll find this message inspiring and encouraging for you today. When I was praying about what to share with you, this message came to mind. And to be honest with you, I thought, I've, I've shared that message with these people before. And, um, and it just kept coming back to me. And I went to sort of my, do a bit of research and I realized that I hadn't shared this message. So I just want to kind of explain to you. This was first given to me in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I spent some time during that time and on the back of it, sharing it with whoever, wherever the Lord sent me, um, both during lockdown and afterwards. And so when I began to seek the Lord as to what to share with you today, this is what had come to mind with me. It's not, it's, it's a fresh message, but it's, it's actually based on something that God had given me a while ago. And being an OVO2, uh, OVO 02 experience last night, it's even more relevant now than I believe it was when the Lord first gave it. So I want you to turn with me, if you've got your Bibles, to Luke chapter 1. And in my Bible, it's subtitled, The Calling of the First Disciples. Luke, sorry, Luke chapter 5, verse 1. Luke chapter 5, verse 1. And I'm reading from the NIV version, which I think might be beamed up um, behind me on the screen. So Luke chapter 5, verse 1. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Genesaret with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats. They were left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. And when he'd finished speaking, he turned to Simon and he said, put out into deep water and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered, Master, we have worked hard all night and we haven't caught anything. But... Because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and he said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man, for he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. And so they pulled up their boats up onto the shore they left everything, and they followed him. Everything. And they followed him. That's so amazing. This was a historic moment in history, never mind just in the church of Jesus Christ. They weren't disciples at this point. It says the calling of the first disciples. Simon wasn't even known as Peter. He was still Simon. This is way back at the very beginning. Now, I might have mentioned to you before, I think I probably have, that my eldest daughter is an archaeologist, and she has a wee kit that she uses to go and do some archaeology. It's got little fine brushes and all sorts of things in there. And uh, so she goes and she investigates different areas. So we're going to take our spiritual forensic kit this morning and just look at this situation of what happened with Simon to cause him to... Changed the entire direction of his whole life. Four simple points for you this morning. Number one, it is evident that Simon, later known to be Peter, was in exactly the right place at exactly the right time. Simon, later to be called Peter, was called by Jesus. And he was to answer that call which resulted in him immediately leaving his business, his boat, his nets, and perhaps even the catch of fish to others to sort out. And he devoted the entire rest of his life to following this carpenter from Nazareth and ultimately laying down his life in martyrdom for Jesus and the gospel. This was no ordinary encounter. Simon was born and bred and brought up on the shores of Galilee. 
He knew these waters better than anyone. He was there washing his nets after a fruitless day or night of work. Right place, right time. You know, the Bible says in Acts 17 that God determined the exact places we should live and the exact times that we should live that we might reach out and that we might find him though he's not very far from each one of us. And I believe that verse also applies to us as believers that he has us in the right place at the right time that we might help others to reach out and to find him. Amen. Amen. So there's no excuses for any of us. We're all called to share our faith. The Bible says of Jesus that just at the right time, God sent his son, born under law, to redeem those under law. Perfect timing, right moment, right time, right place. This was Simon's perfect time. This could be your perfect time today. And I believe with recent events, we stand on the cusp of a great move of God. Not only world events, but everything that's been happening in our nation, the passing of our queen, the appointment of a new king, change in our prime minister, and potentially a change again. And wherever you are today, whatever you are, 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 whether you're here in person or watching or listening online, this could be a divine appointment for you. Strong's Concordance divines this time as kairos, and it means a fitting season, an opportunity, an occasion, a proper time. The New Testament lexicon defines it this way, a due measure, a fixed definite time, a time when things are brought to a crisis. Brought to a crisis. What describes our age, our generation, and our situation other than that? A Kairos moment for us. Kairos moment for you. A Kairos moment for me. Decisive epoch that's been waited for. A right moment. How many of you have been waiting for revival? Amen. Amen. This is your opportunity. This is your fitting season. This is your proper time. This is your right moment. The Bible says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as they did in the desert and they did in Mara, but soften your hearts for today is the day of salvation. And I'm not just necessarily meaning salvation is coming first to Christ, but what God has for you is purpose. This was Peter's moment. This could be your moment. This could be our moment right now. This could be our moment. Do you know, they just returned the stone of destiny back to Perth. There were prophecies given in the 50s and the 60s of the last century that said, when the stone of destiny is returned to its proper place, revival will come to Scotland. And when it came back in, I think it was 1992 in Edinburgh, the body of Christ got all excited, got all hit up. Oh, the stone's back, the stone's back. The stone was not back. It was not supposed to be in Edinburgh. It's supposed to be in Perth. It is now back in Perth. And it might be surrounded by all sorts of new age and LGBT stuff and all that. But that's just, just the periphery stuff. We just wash all that away. Because that moment, the stone of destiny, listen to its title, destiny, destiny, destiny. The stone of destiny is back in Scotland. And God is about to take back this nation for himself. It's his nation. It's his land. It's his people. And my friends, it's his church. Whatever name, Church of Scotland, the Baptist Church, the Pentecostal, we are his church. This is our moment. This is our moment. He sets the exact places, the exact times. Jesus was preaching and teaching at a precise time when Simon was washing and fixing his nets. I remember, I don't think I've shared this testimony before, but I remember when I was pastoring, there was a lady in my church who ended up in hospital. She ended up largely because of her, her own situation. I had to go and see her. I had a stinking attitude. I'm just, I'm just confessing that to you. I had a stinking attitude. I went with my, youngest, my eldest son. He was only 10 or 11 at the time. We went to the hospital. And um, I went in too. I was a bit reluctant. I went in. I sat down with her. As it happens, we had a lovely time. Lovely time of fellowship. Prayed with her. I was really blessed. I felt quite convicted. I came out, and as I walked through the doors, the revolving doors of the old hospital of Dumfries, I heard my voice. I'll come up, and I turned around. It was a young man from my community. His eyes were streamed with tears. He was eyes were all red. I said, "What is it?" It's my mum. She's dying. I said, "I knew she had cancer." He said, "No, she's dying. We've been called. My sister's been called. They say that she's not going to last the, the the day we've been called here." 
And I looked at him, I said, do you want me to go up and speak to you? Oh, would you? I said, yeah, I'll come up with you. So I went up, my son was there, and we went in and we sat down. I sat down, this woman who was, who was big in character, and she was also a big lady, you don't mind me saying that. She was a big lady, she was very friendly, but she was, didn't know Jesus. And she was reduced to about seven or eight stones. She was sitting there, she had throat cancer, she could no longer speak or anything, and, and I had just taken her away. And I sat there with her, and I was... The, fa- the father was there, his sister, my friend's sister was there, and it was an awkward situation. I don't know what it was about her. She was into something dark because the atmosphere was terrible. She'd thrown daggers at me, and, and I'm just, and I chatted. It was all light stuff. And I had to go because I had a loan car. My car was getting serviced. I had to be at a certain place, a certain time. So I said, look, I've got to go. Do you want me to come back, though? He said, oh, would you? I said, yeah, I'll come back. So I went away. I phoned up my friends. Folk pray, 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 getting people praying. I dropped off my son at um, Sandy Jameson's house with his wife. And uh, I picked up my car, and then I went back. And, I went, and as I was walking in, I was saying, Lord, you've got to do something here because this woman's not going to last a night. And this, this, the daughter of hers is like, oh, she's just... So I went in. I sat down. The son was there, daughter was there, father was over there. And I sat down, and the instant I sat down, the father turned to his daughter and said, look, the dog's been in the car all morning, we need to go and take it for a walk. And she went out. So I just said, I don't know how long I got. Sat down, my friend was opposite. I started to speak to this lady, the presence of God just descended in that room. I know the presence of God. And I sat and I chatted with her, and I spoke to her about the Lord, spoke to her about her life. I said, look... I know you love everybody, and I know that you're a nice person, but that doesn't get you into heaven. Only Jesus saves. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And she was nodding her head. I said, and I went through the whole gospel. I said, do you believe what I've told you? And she nodded her head. I said, do you honestly believe? She nodded her head. I said, will you pray with me? She nodded her head. I said, I know you can't speak, but if I say a line after line and you nod your head, and I'll take that as being, and she nodded her head, and I took her through the prayer of salvation, and she gave her life to Christ. <laughs> gave her life to Christ. The instant I finished... The moment I finished, the father and the daughter comes back in. Now, I had to go, and I said to her son, I said, I've got to go. And I went out, and he came out. He was, like, just bawling his eyes out. And he says to me, he says, oh, I prayed for her healing as well. He said, I prayed for her healing. And he said, oh, I believe she's healed. I believe she's healed. I turned to him. I said, look, she may or may not be healed. I don't know. I said, but did you hear what happened in there? Did you see what happened in there? He said, yeah. I said, no matter what happens, your mom is in the arms of Jesus. I flew out that next day for my Easter holidays and I heard when I came back she died that next morning and went into the arms of Jesus Christ. Right place, right time. You're in the right place, right time. God doesn't make mistakes. God doesn't make mistakes. Someone simplified the word kairos. I love this definition. Where time and destiny meet. The stone of destiny is back. God's time. Time for Scotland. Time for you, time for me, time for the church of Jesus. At the proper time while we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. When time and destiny meet, even the manner in which each person comes to Jesus and responds to him in humility, in repentance and faith, it's different for each and every one of us. The Bible's proof of this. We have a crisis when the centurion comes interceding for his servant. We have healing of Bartimaeus who couldn't see. We had conviction of sin here with Simon Peter on the shores of Galilee. We have the wonder of God's love when Mary Magdalene is broken by his mercy and his goodness. We have the fear of judgment when the adulteress is thrown at his feet. We have the gifts of the Spirit and a word of knowledge with the woman at the well. We have a vision or a dream with Saul of Tarsus. And we have a deathbed conversion with the thief that's on the cross. The manner in which each person comes to Christ is different. But the common experience is Jesus and the cross. It's the only way that you can be saved. It's the only way I can be saved. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to God except by me. It says in Luke, he wrote in the Acts of the Apostles, salvation is found in no one else. There's no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. And Paul said, there's one mediator between God and man. It is the man Christ Jesus. We are saved through an encounter with Jesus Christ. Many of you knew old Danny Vicker. Danny Vicker, the evangelist. I just got to know him for a couple of years at the end of his life. And I remember him coming into my house. He was a guest. He stayed with us for a few days. And the moment he came into my my house, I opened the door. It was midnight. He was delayed. He comes in. He walks in. He shakes my hands and he says, are you saved? (laughs) Are you saved? You're smiling because you remember him. 
asked everyone, are you saved? If I asked everyone, are you saved? I'd get slapped, but he just did it in such a way. I asked him to pray for me to give me that kind of boldness. So, right place, right time. Secondly, Jesus had need of Simon and his boat. He had need of Simon and his boat. That's that's important. Jesus got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and he asked him to put out a little from the shore. Jesus approached Peter first. He approached Peter first. The first approach in reconciling a man or a woman to God always starts with God. Always starts with God. Adam, where are you? You think God didn't know where Adam was? Of course he knew where Adam was. Abraham, to come out, look up at the stars, so shall your offspring be. Jacob, he had a wrestling match with him that lasted all night. I don't fancy that one. Moses in the burning bush. Noah, I'm bringing a flood, therefore build me a boat. The disciples, Jesus approached them and said, Come, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Zacchaeus, I love the story of Zacchaeus. Wandering around, he's up a tree. As far as he knows, Jesus hasn't seen him. And Jesus stops, looks up and says, Zacchaeus, I'm going to eat at your house tonight. What? I can imagine Matthew, you know, and and Peter, well, Simon, Peter at the... Objecting to that. He's a tax collector. He's not going to come and eat with you. You're not going to go to his house, are you? You came to mind me. You're not going to his. I must go to his house. I'm going to your house tonight. He approached Zacchaeus first. Invited himself into his house. Saul of Tarsus, he kicked him off his high horse. And said, why do you resist me so? God always makes the approach makes the approach. So many stories. I remember uh, my friends and I were, <laughs> we were getting in a train to go to a town called Saratov, which is in the south of Russia. It was 26 hours on a train. Seriously, 26, from Moscow. And we booked our little compartment, four be- uh, beds in this compartment. Myself, my gospel friend, and my translator, We'd had this thing booked. So as we're coming on to the, go into our carriage, Max, my translator, turns around and says, oh, by the way, Malcolm, you mustn't speak while you're in this train. I said, what? I can't speak for 26 hours? He said, you're not supposed to be going to Saratov. Apparently, they, they made MiG jets there, so Westerners weren't supposed to be. And I'm like, what? We've got a three-night crusade that's been advertised and everything. How <laughs> far is this that I'm not supposed to speak? I'm going to be speaking there. Anyway, I said, okay, that's fine. So we went in, and we got into our compartment, and it was great. We settled down for this long journey, the, the three of us. So as we are traveling down, I could hear this radio in the background. It was really irritating. This radio going, Russian radio going. I, I said to Max, what's that radio? Can you turn it? He says, you can't turn it off. He said, you only turn it down so much. I said, we've got that for 26 hours and we're supposed to be sleeping and having all this journey. He said, yeah, I'm afraid so. So anyway, the journey went on. I don't know how much later it was, but I just sort of mentioned to Max about this radio and Max says, oh, the, the DJ is on this carriage. I said, what? Now, I'm telling you this, I'm not exaggerating, this train was like, I don't know, half a mile long. There were probably over a thousand, well over a thousand people on the train. And he says, the DJ is on this carriage. I said, in this carriage? He said, yeah, seriously. He says, yeah. I said, you think he would let me speak and maybe Roly play a song? Well, I'll ask him, he says. So he goes up, he asks him, he says, oh, I'd love to have you come. So here we are, we're on the train, and I'm just preaching the gospel. Roly really sings his song, and Max tells him what the songs are about. And then I just shared the gospel and uh, told him about the cross, told him about Jesus. And I said, if you want to receive Christ as your Savior and Lord, pray this prayer. And I'm praying the prayer on the radio that no one can switch off on a carriage that's half a mile long, and everybody's stuck there for 26 hours. God sets up his situations, amen. He moves when he wants to move. And we'll never know, I'll never know this side of eternity, the fruit of that, but it was so exciting. Jesus said, no man can come to me unless the Father draw him. God's got to draw people. The Bible says, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, not to hurt you or to harm you, but to bless you and give you a hope and a future. You are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he's prepared in advance for us to do. 
He's gone ahead of us. He's moving and he's preparing the way for us. Some of you might have heard me tell the story of when John Glass came to preach many years ago in our church. He was telling about how when his wife and him went to, I think it was Tenerife, if I remember, on holiday, and they were all gathered on the beach, and they're all t- sharing with the rep and that, and said, oh, what do you all do for a living? So they went around. The second woman, oh, I, I, I tell fortunes. I, I read palms and tell. Next minute, everybody's up, and they're all lined up having their palms to be read, and and John shared this, that he was sitting there and he's praying, Lord, how, how do I deal with this one? How do I deal with it? I think it was John Glass or Jim Dick, one of the two. How do I deal with this? How do I deal with that? And when the, 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 late, the rep who was there looked up and said, before any of the palm reading had done, said, excuse me, sir, but um, you've not joined the, the queue. What, what's the reason for that? He said, I'll tell you why. Because my future is not written in my palms. My future is written in the nail-pierced hands of the Son of God who died on a cross for me. What an amazing response. And apparently not a single person, they all sat down. Not a single person had their palms read. Somebody once said, I don't know what the future holds, but I do know who holds the future. Jesus holds your future. My darling sister, Jesus holds your future. Jesus holds your future. My future, our future, the future of our nation is in the hands of Jesus. Firmly, securely in his hands. Simon Peter was already a fisherman. Now he becomes a fisher of men. God was moving ahead of him. Third thing. At Jesus' word, Simon put down his net in spite of his vastly greater experience and against all his better judgment. Listen. It says, after he finished speaking, Jesus said to Simon, put out into deep water, let down the net. It was the wrong time of day. It was the wrong place. And it was certainly the wrong person giving him advice. Jesus was a carpenter. As far as anyone knows, he's never touched a net in his entire life. And here's this man born and brought up on the shores of Galilee, listening to a carpenter and how to do his business. But he gives way to him and he says, because you say so, I will let down the nets. Simon heard Jesus' voice and Simon obeyed the voice of Jesus. God is always speaking, but are we listening? Are we tuning in? Are we tuning in to what he says? I've given you... Story before, apparently a true story, when the MOD were looking for a new communications director, they put out an invitation all over the sort of sound audio world, and, and hundreds, a hundred people, candidates came. They came to the, the beautiful building, there was food laid out, there was nice music playing in the background, coffee drifting in everybody's noses, and they were all waiting to be called in for the interview. And they're all chatting, they're all saying, oh, I've had three years here, and oh, I've got this certificate here. I went to this university, and I've got that certificate, and I've had that experience with these people, and everything. And everybody is talking shop over each, body. and time goes past, about an hour goes, and nobody has been called. People are coming and going to the toilet, but nobody's come in to say, come for your interview. So they're all sitting there, and then suddenly somebody comes in, official-looking person, stands up and says, Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you can all go home now. And they're all looking, what? I've traveled 300 miles to be here. I flew to be here. We've come here from all over the place. And you haven't even interviewed anyone. Oh, no, that's not true, they said. We've interviewed our candidate. He's the right man, and he's been given the job. You haven't interviewed anyone. Yes, yes, we have, they say. Because while you're all talking and talking shop and exchanging your experiences, we sent out a message in Morse code over the tannoy. If you hear this, come to room number seven and you can have your interview. One man heard it. One man heard it in the middle of all the shop talk. One man heard it. I want to ask you a question. And I ask you as I ask myself, are we tuning in in the midst of all the religious shop talk to what God is saying to us at this time? Are we tuning in? Are we tuning in? Right now, as we're talking here, there's all kind of sound waves in the air here, but you have to have the right equipment set at the right frequency to tune in to what's being said. Amen? Are you tuning in? Am I tuning in? Simon tuned in because you said so I will do it he took Jesus at his word 
Look at those who've taken Jesus at his word. Jesus talked about the house on the rock, do you remember? And one who built in the sand, he hears the word, hears it, but he doesn't put it into practice. But there's one who hears it, understands it, puts it into practice, builds his house on solid rock. What about James who says, do not merely read the word, but do what it says. The centurion who came to Jesus to ask him to come and heal his servant. And Jesus said, I'll go. And he says, Lord, I don't even deserve you to have you in my house. Just say the word. Just say the word. Just say it. And he will be healed. He will be healed. And Mary, his mom at the wedding at Cana, he turns to those who were serving. Go see my son and do whatever he tells you to do. That's a word of the Lord for you this morning. Go to the son and do whatever he tells you to do. Do what he tells you to do. When Rosanna and I were planning to go into Russia in 1990, three months after the Berlin Wall came down, we had a friend who's a missionary in the Soviet Union. He'd been in Sofia in Bulgaria in the dark days. And uh, I, I told him, I said, oh, Ros and I are planning to buy a 4 before diesel vehicle. Oh, no, no, don't buy diesel. The diesel is garbage over here in Russia. And besides, as soon as you get into winter, it freezes and you can't go anywhere. But God said, diesel, diesel. Kept saying diesel to us. Ask my wife about this. Diesel, diesel. Stupid thing to buy a diesel vehicle. You go into a, a country that has frequently minus 30, 35 degrees, and I'm buying a diesel vehicle. But we succumbed to what God was saying to us. We bought a diesel four before we went in. Do you know from the moment we entered into Russia, true story, if she were here, she would tell you, there was a petrol strike across the whole country for months, months. And there were queues, and you might think this is an exaggeration, but the, the lifestyle over there, this is, the, the, this is during the dark, the, you know, just after the Berlin Wall had come down. There were queues, miles long. People were sleeping in their cars just to wait for a, a tank of petrol. We would drive up my diesel vehicle. We'd drive past all these people, go to the diesel pump where nobody was, because who gets diesel in a, a country so cold as that? We'd fill up, which incidentally, 70 liters of diesel cost me about... $10, which was seven pounds at the time, fell out getting a car down the road. Because we heard what God said, and in spite of how stupid it seemed to the world, we obeyed what he said. There are many in the scriptures could attest to that, and I've got time to go through that. So Simon's experience is similar. Wrong time, wrong place, definitely the wrong man. Foolhardly wasteful, but Lord, because you say so. God always has his plan. God always has his timing and his place. He always has his man and his woman, and he always has his purposes. Always. And we've seen indie rafe and Brexit and COVID and Gaza, Ukraine, China and Taiwan. Now we've got a general election around the corner. We're hearing of Russian submarines off the coast of Scotland. We, we are living in perilous times, friends. This is our time now. The God who knows the number of hairs on each of your heads. He knows you all by name, but he has every hair counted on your head. He knows our words before we say them. He knows our thoughts from afar. He knows numbers and calls each star by name. When a sparrow falls to the ground, he knows it. And it was Spurgeon who said famously, I serve a God who goes to the funeral of every sparrow. I think of that verse every time I hit a bird or anything when I'm in my car, it breaks my heart. <laughs> oh Lord, there's another funeral you've had to go to. <laughs> Our God has full knowledge and control of all the affairs and all the plans of man, beasts, or devils. So do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. And so I come... Really to my last point and really the heart and soul of this message and this word for you this morning. The fourth point I'll make to you tonight, to, to this morning is this. All Simon and the others could see was what was going on on the surface. That's what they were looking at. But God was at work underneath the surface, in the deep and in the unseen realm. And during this time of covid I was praying and I was bemoaning God because we weren't seeing revival. We weren't seeing the, the, nation, the, the people turning back to God in repentance. We weren't seeing any of that. But I had this, I don't know if it was a vision or a dream, I can't remember. And what I saw was Jesus teaching from the boat. 
And the disciples and the people crowds around listening. And then I saw Simon setting off. Jesus was sat in the boat, and I could see Simon at the head of his boat, thinking to himself, what am I doing? This is mental. Wrong time, wrong place, wrong man. But it was like I was taken under the water, almost like in a submersible. And as I went under the water, under the water, this is what I could see. Shoals of fish, shoals of them, were all moving to one particular spot from all kinds of different directions. They were all coming to one particular spot, the spot where Jesus told them to stop and throw his net out into the water. The fish had gathered there for him to reap the harvest. And they were moving to the spot. And however you see that whole period in time of COVID, God was at work under the surface. He was very much at work. Do you know when God called Noah to build the ark, Noah didn't have to go around corralling all the animals. Praise God for that. They came to him. They came to him, but he had to get them on the boat, but they came to him. Came to him. I tell you a story that happened just a couple of years ago. It was just after COVID. My youngest son has a tortoise. At that time, he had a bearded dragon, a salmon pink bird-eating tarantula spider, uh, a snake called Iona, which we still have, and uh, a couple of geckos. Oh, well, he didn't have the geckos by then, but he has this tortoise spud. So my wife thought it was a good idea that just to clear up her little um, planter out in the, the patio, she would put spud out there. After all, it had a wire netting around him. Now, spud was like Steve McQueen in The Great Escape. Every minute he could get, he was always trying to escape. So she put him in there thinking he was secure, went back. No spud, disappeared. Now, I live in the countryside, so you can go in one direction of our house, and I'm, I, think, I don't think I'm exaggerating. You could go in one particular direction, you could probably go about 70 or 80 miles and never hit a house. I live in the countryside, so it's just countryside as far as you can go. Did we search for spud? Oh, man, we looked everywhere. We prayed. Now, my daughter, she works for Open Doors. She's down in, she was praying every day, spud return, spud return. No sign of spud. I went, I did everything. I did everything. <laughs> okay, right. So I thought, how can we attract spuds? So my office is right in the middle of my garden. So I opened the windows, right? So I went online and I recorded mating tortoises. <laughs> True story. <laughs> I recorded mating tortoises. I put them in a CD, I put it on a repeat, and I put it on full blast. So over Fleet Valley, you got this noise. <laughs> this is me trying to get Spud back into the house. I tried everything, nothing happened. Eight, nine months. I had just completely written it off, okay? I was no longer in faith, forgotten about Spud, getting on. So I'm in Inverness, right? I'm up in Inverness, and I'm in Starbucks with my dad, and my phone pings, and I get this photograph. Now, this isn't the actual photograph up here. I don't know if I, but This is Spud, right? This, this tortoise is like, I'm like, whoa. And I'm, Dad, Dad, I've got a phone. I've got a phone, Ben. This is like nine months, nine, ten months. Coldest winter we'd had for a long time. I said, what's happened? What's happened? He said, oh, Dad, you'll never believe it. And here's what happened, right? That morning, it was, a, I think it was a Thursday, my wife goes to work, and on her way to work, there's two guys, high-vis jackets, and they're doing some fencing, and she stops, and she said, hey, guys, and he said, oh, yeah, oh, nice to see you this morning, listen, I've got to go to work, but I just want to say to you, my son, his name's Ben, and he lives in that house over there, and he's lost his tortoise, his tortoise is called Spud, he disappeared, oh, almost a year ago, and he's somewhere out there, if you happen to find a tortoise, just go in that door, there's a true story, folks, so... My son relates this. So he's a student, and it's typical, in bed till one o'clock. So half past 11 or something in the morning, there's a knock on the door, right? I want you to picture this, a knock on the door. He opens the door, he's kind of in his shorts and his T-shirt, and two guys he's never met before in his life, high visibility vest, and he goes, oh, hi, Ben, we brought Spud back for you. <laughs> That's absolutely awesome. <laughs> 
I have seen many people come to Christ just telling that story. Because if God will answer the prayers of a woman who's faithful to bring back a tortoise, how much more will he bring back the addicts and the sons and the daughters and the prodigals and those who've lifted, who've gone astray and have no idea, like blind leading the blind. God is going to pull the stops out in Scotland and he's going to anoint us. He's going to empower us. He's going to set up things for us. He's going to do immeasurably above and beyond all you could ever ask. Ask or imagine, because he promised it in the scripture. Amen. Sorry I'm shouting, but I am excited because God is exciting. Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father draw him. All human eyes, senses, faculties are always fixed on watching world events, economy, geography, the weather, the temperature, the ecology, the economy, the NHS, all of these things. Jesus was looking at the unseen, the invisible, the deep, the spiritual, the eternal. And I don't just mean the fish under the water. Because the fish were moving to where he wanted them to be. Where God wanted them to be. And when Simon caught this fish, I want you to understand that this man had spent his life fishing. He'd had some good days on that water. But when he sees this, he's a broken man. (laughs) He falls. He says, God, Lord, I'm a sinful man. Get away from me. Why? Because God did such a miracle. It blew him out of the water. God did above and beyond all he had ever seen in his entire life. And he knew this man is a Messiah. This man is a Christ. This man's going to be my Savior, my Lord, and my best friend for as long as I can live. That was a moment that changed his life. The moment that he changed your life, my life, on a beach in Dornoch in 1987. He comes and he reveals who he is. Almighty master and king. From this moment, Simon, now Peter, was never the same again. He left everything to follow Jesus and eventually to martyrdom. Jesus said to him, don't be afraid from now on. You will catch men. When God determines to do something with somebody, no one, nothing, can stop him. He's unstoppable. And I see what God's doing now. Right now, God's doing two things. Listen to this. Two things. There are the suddenlies of God where he's going to change things suddenly, just overnight. You'll see things happen. But there's another thing. And I saw this picture just a few weeks ago. I've shared it a few times. You know those big super tankers that take the containers? They're massive things, huge things. I saw this container ship. Now, when they want to change direction, they have to change direction about 15, 20 miles before they're going where they're going. And they have to turn it. And unless you are experienced and sensitive on that ship as a sailor, you wouldn't even notice you're changing course. God is changing the course. He is moving the super tanker. He is turning this nation back to himself. The Bible says faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Someone attributed to Einstein the saying, insanity is to doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. And that may be true in the world, but when God decides to do something, we can throw out the rule book because D.L. Moody said this, that when he experienced that thing on the streets of San Francisco or Los Angeles, wherever it was, I'm not sure, he felt God come and power just where he was. He just felt his power hit him. And he said this, he said, I went to the same people, the same places, the same sermons, but now the fire fall. Last night we saw the fire fall as people were brought under conviction and under the reality of the gospel. All things are possible for God and all things are possible for him who believes. It's one thing to watch the economy, to watch the people, to watch the government. But when the Lord says, it's time to launch out your boats, then the natural gives way to supernatural. Limitations of man gives way to the unlimited power of God. And the will and purposes of man will give way to the will and purposes of God. So sometime in the middle of COVID, the pandemic, the Lord said to me, son... You're looking at society, you're looking at politics, you're looking at economy, you're looking at response or lack of response, you're looking at Brexit, India, the state of the church, 
but I am doing something in the deep, in the unseen, under the surface, in hearts and minds of the people of this nation. And he did two things, and I haven't got time to go into tonight, but in the church it was a Gideon moment. 32,000, 10,000, 300, yes, victory, victory. We may see what's happened as negative, but this is God's church. This is his church. I hear people saying, oh, the Church of Scotland has closed 90 churches there, 90 churches there, 10 churches here. The Church of Scotland hasn't closed a single church. All they've closed is buildings. The people of God are coming alive. They're getting on fire. There might be less than what they were, but God is sifting out the men from the boys and the women from the girls. And it's time to stop faffing around and get on with the job of winning this nation to Christ. Of preaching Jesus. Bringing him to the people. And while he's been doing that in the church, he's been changing hearts. Unseen. Yes, unseen. For the last four years since COVID, I've seen more people coming to Christ in church services like this, on the pavements, on platforms, in events and all of that, than I've ever seen in my ministry in Scotland. I'm talking about in Scotland. I'm not talking about Russia and other countries, but in Scotland. Why? Because God's doing something. Something unseen that you and I need to look at and need to fix our hearts and our minds on. There's much more going on right now than what meets the eye. And I'm not referring to the conspiracy theories, which may or may not be true. Everything happening now is building up to the imminent return of Jesus. The environment, ethnic conflicts, one world economy, religion, one world religion, earthquakes, famines, Middle East conflicts, technology, wars, rumors of wars, the Iran-Israel thing that we have. But God is sovereign. God is in control. He's working in the, under the surface, in the unseen, in the spiritual, in the eternal and I'm not saying we ignore what's going on. The Bible says this, that against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and became the father of many nations, just as it has been said of him. So shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead. And since he was about 100 years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead, yet... He did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith, gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised to do. There's an opening of eyes, there's a softening of hearts, there's a broadening of minds, there's a ripening of the harvest, there's a gathering harvest, and sometimes it's almost, we don't even know what's going on. Last week when I was in Annan, I had the morning off, but a friends who were there said, oh, we're going to River of Life in, in, in Dumfries, which was 30 miles away. I said, I'll go with you. I used to belong to that church, a small fellowship, 30, 40 people. And after COVID, they went into, they started to see people coming in. They didn't know why. And they went into, had to go on a bigger premise. I went into their church service last Sunday morning and the place was full. I reckon 200 people were there from every tribe, nation and tongue. And when I asked them, what have you been doing? They said, nothing different. Nothing different. Because God is on the move. And just like your pastor said, there's times when they're going to be lining up. That We think that is some sort of preacher hype. That's not preacher hype. God's going to move in this land. And one was done. Simon was tired. Simon was frustrated. Simon was disappointed. Simon was actually both mending and cleaning his nets at the end of a fruitful harvest. Maybe COVID-19 was for us to mend and clean our nets get ourselves sorted out and get ready for the harvest. Simon was where many of God's people are right now, weary and discouraged. But Jesus just happened to be in God's agenda and God's schedule. Can I borrow your boat, Simon? Put out into deep water. Lay down your nets. He was discouraged. He was disappointed. We've worked hard all night, Lord, but because you say so, we will let down the nets resulted in a huge catch, so much that other boats had to come and they began to sink too. Simon's brokenness and his preparation for what God had in store for him. But here's the point for us. Here's a point for you and me. Simon still had to clean the nets. He still had to mend the nets. He still had to sail the boat out. He still had to let down the net for a catch. And he still needed the help of others to bring in the harvest. 
They weren't like these of uh, Asian carp. I should have got a, a clip from the YouTube for you because there's a, there's a, a river in, somewhere in Asia where a certain time of year they just jump into the boats. You know, we all, we'd all like to have that, just them jumping in the boats. Not like that. We still have to go out. We still have to clean our nets. We still have to go out and put down the let, nets down for a harvest. And so here's, in closing, is some, a challenge for you, some thoughts. Are you focusing on the wrong things? Is a glass half empty or half full for you? Are you wasting your time and energy on irrelevant frivolities? I'm not talking about just having leisure time. I'm hoping to have a few days off tomorrow and just do nothing. Just relax, go swimming in Arachar Bay maybe. It's not, I'm not talking about that, but just things that are just not fruitful and not profitable. Are your eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith? Have you rolled up your sleeves? I just happened to have rolled up my sleeves today, so that's a good example. Have you rolled up your sleeves and put your shoulder at the plow, come alongside pastor or other leaders and say, anything I can do to help out here? Anything I can do to give myself and time to the glory of our Lord and Savior Jesus? Are you missing what God is doing in the unseen? And are you ready for what God is about to do? I speak in a multi-church prayer group and I think you've had dealings with them in Perth. And the first time I was there, I was invited by the lady to a home group. Her name's Helen. And um, I was sharing, I was telling her stories, and then I mentioned, I dropped a name, my best friend's a guy called Roly Johnson. She says, you know Roly Johnson? I said, yeah, he's, he's my best pal. I said, him and my other mate, my other mate's got to be the Lord, but Roly's my best pal. Oh, let me tell you a story about Roly. I said, oh, that sounds interesting. She said, he came to Perth Centre as a guest. He played for them at one of their dinners. He said, she said, I bought one of his albums. So she had this album and she had it and she put it in a drawer, forgot all about it. Now this lady has guests, she has guests staying, overseas students. So she had this Chinese student staying with her who was at Perth College and she needed to get her diploma so she could go to Wales University to study music for her degree. And she said, I had this lady staying with me. Um, I try not to drop her name, but I don't know. This lady, let's call her, I don't know. She's Chinese anyway, okay? So she said, she was away at, her, at the college. She said, I'm, I'm at the house and I'm cleaning up. And she said, I found Rolly's CD. I thought, oh, I'm going to put that on. I'm going to put it on. So she puts the CD on. And as she's playing the CD, doing her housework, this girl comes back and she comes into the dining room and my friend just hears her sobbing, sobbing her eyes out. And she goes through and she says, what's wrong, what's wrong? She says, I've failed, my finals, I've failed. I can't, I've got to go home now, I have to go back to China. I've failed, I can't go on to Wales University. And she's bawling her eyes out. And Helen had been witnessing to her and she says, look, let's pray, I'm going to pray for you. And she starts to pray for her. And as she starts to pray for her, there's a song, Rolly's song, it's called, it's called, Hold Your Head Up High, Hold Your Head High. And this is, the, ver this is the, the, the song verse. Hold your head high, brush those tears, brush those tears from your eyes. There's always a way through these mountains. There's always a way through these mountains in our lives. I'm coming back. I'm coming back for you. And, she, and, and, she, and, and this girl looks up and she looks, she says, Helen, oh my goodness, I just heard that. And she said, that's God speaking to you. That's God speaking to you. He's got this for you. Dry those tears. And she prays with them. Then she gives her heart to Jesus because she'd been witnessing to him. She gets saved. She gets a Bible. And immediately, Helen starts a sort of Bible study with her. So the next day, or two days later, I can't remember exactly the time frame, this girl comes back and she's like, you'll never believe what's happened. You'll never believe it, what's happened. She's all excited. The dean called me into his office and said, look, we made a mistake with everything. You've actually passed. You're going on to Wales University. And she's like, God answered my prayer. It's so exciting, so awesome. She had some time before she left there to go on to Wales University. I'm not finished yet. Just you wait to hear what happened, right? So she goes to Wales University to do her master's degree in music, right? She goes in, she's at freshers week, she's a fresher, but she's in third year because she's got a diploma that got, it bumped her up. So she's at third year, so the authorities come and they said to Shoe, she, I just dropped her name, and they said to Shoe, it doesn't matter now, I, it's just, you never know how things get back. But anyway, says to Shoe, um, we've got a problem, we've got all these Chinese students, they don't speak English, we need you to help them, will you take them under your wing? She said, I can't, I'm a fresher myself. No, you're not, you're in third year. She's like, I've just arrived. 
please, we need someone. We need someone like... So she says, okay, she did. She took all the Chinese uh, students there. Every single one of those Chinese students came to Christ. Every single one of them came to Jesus. She got her degree, and now she is one of the top opera singers in one of their national music groups traveling around inland China, sharing Jesus, proclaiming Jesus as Lord. One foreign student. So I'm going to say to you, my dear friends, don't give in to discouragement or fear. Every tear you've wept, every word you've sown, every shoulder you've cried on and cried with, God is working in the unseen, in the invisible, in the eternal, and there is coming a greater harvest than you and I could ever imagine. Why? Because he said so. Because he said so. Amen. Isn't God amazing? I want just to bow our heads and close our eyes just for a moment. I'm sorry I've gone over my time a little bit. So what happens when you get an evangelist come to share. As I just finish and pray, I want to ask anybody here, you may have come in here, I don't know everybody that's here, no many, but you might have come here today out of curiosity or friends invited you. Or, but if you don't know this Jesus that I'm talking about, it's Jesus who changed this man's life, who's just revolutionary, changed your life for eternity. If you don't know him as your personal Savior and Lord, and this morning you would say, I want Jesus in my heart. I want Jesus in my life. I want to go and win uh, fish for men and women on, for him, for his glory. If that's you, just raise your hand where we are, where every head is bowed and every eye is closed. If you're here this morning, I want to just give a moment, and I'm not going to labor it, because if there is anybody here, I don't want to miss you. Um, if you, are not, if you ha don't know the Lord Jesus and you want to know him. Okay. Praise God. I'm going to assume that every one of us here knows the Lord Jesus. Just well, let's just all, as we, as we are in this posture of humility before the Lord. Father, I thank you for being here today. Thank you for being part of this church family, for all that you're doing in the lives of my brothers and my sisters and my friend here, the pastor, and his wife and myself, Lord. And Lord, it's all about you. It's not about us. Not about our personalities or our abilities or our giftings. It's all about you, Lord Jesus, and what you've done and what you're doing and what you're going to do. And I pray, Lord, you would seal this word on hearts this morning, that they would go out of this place knowing you've got it, you've got every hand in hand, the right place, right time, and that you're going to deal with all the issues, Lord, whether they're personal issues in their own lives, whether it's questioning what they're to do or where they're to go or how they're to minister, Father. I pray that you fit us all into the place that you want us to be, that we would give you all the honor and all the glory and all the majesty that's due your name, and that we would be of this generation that would see the greatest harvest of souls ever in history, especially in this land of Scotland, which we know needs it so much. And like Abraham, Lord, we don't stick our head in the sand. We're not denying where we we are and what the situation is, but Lord, help us not to waver in unbelief, but in hope, believe knowing you who promised God, you are faithful. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching. If you've been challenged today, then please drop a message so that we can help support and pray for you. And also, remember to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss the next message.